The Excelsior class, everybody's favorite starship put through a taffy puller. It's the Slim Jim of Star Trek Starfleet vessels. It was presented as a major rival to the Enterprise. It was the next generation of Starfleet ship. We're shown the great experiment first in Star Trek III, where Excelsior is presented somewhat nonsensically, in my opinion, as a bit of an antagonist for the Enterprise and her crew. The ship which is poised to steal Enterprise's mantle as the fastest in the fleet, as if it's crazy or a bad thing that a newer ship would come along with superior capabilities to a kind of old ship. Minor tangent incoming. But I could never really understand the Excelsior's treatment in her first showing. Um, like, is she supposed to be something bad in the movie? Are we not supposed to like Excelsior? Because I always came away from the movie just thinking that the Excelsior looked cool, and that it's a good thing that Scotty is a genius and was able to find a few computer chips which would, could cripple the ship without blowing her up or shutting down life support so the crew suffocates or something like that. I liked the design. I get that not everybody did. It was a fairly radical departure, but I think the decades have been kind to the common people's perception of the ship. But if that is what they were going for, they did it badly. Also, it's just as likely that they were presenting the class as the next step forward for Starfleet, and were just supposed to feel about how I did from the start. Uh, that being said, I do totally understand why Scotty doesn't like the ship. He worked for decades aboard Connie-derived designs, usually the Constitution class named Enterprise, and he'd become a master of his craft. The next generation coming in, as with all new emerging and incoming technologies, which replace earlier methods of doing things, likely made him feel threatened, and like he would soon be out of touch and out of the loop. Nobody likes the world moving on while you stand still, and nobody likes how having to relearn to do something in a new program or piece of software. Alright, uh, minor tangent and probable lack of understanding of cinema or filmmaking out of the way, let's get back to the topic at hand, which is... Oh! Excelsior! And why it stuck around. That was quite an introduction, wasn't it? So yes, Excelsior, after its initial appearance in the third Star Trek film, would go on to make several further appearances in the next several movies with the original cast. The ship herself would appear the final time in the undiscovered country under the command of Captain, now, Hikaru Sulu. Uh, she would fight in that battle, she would do stuff in really, I like undiscovered country. It's a decent film. Much better than Final Frontier. Uh, which I don't think is a hot take on the internet. Continuity-wise, Excelsior herself fades into the background a bit from here. Some sources claim that we see the ship in several battles of the Dominion War. There are a number of background Excelsiors we see. But the ship herself, as a named member of the class, fades from our view from here. Excelsior would eventually, though, prove herself to be a valuable and viable design. But due to the extensive delays experienced bringing her into service over a decade past when she was supposed to be, and a lag of multiple years before new classes utilizing her technologies could be brought into service, as well as the ongoing hot peace with the Klingons and Romulan empires, and the reliance on dated, somewhat thrown-together designs from the 2270s, would all result in Starfleet rushing construction of large numbers of Excelsior-class ships to make the most of their technological superiority and fill out the fleet while they could. The result of all of this was that by the start of the 24th century, Excelsior had become a prolific and vital component of Starfleet, being present in the largest numbers of any cruiser class ever built up to that moment. This would stand Starfleet in very good stead following the Tomid incident, and subsequent Treaty of Algeron, which would see the Romulan Empire withdraw behind the neutral zone once more, leaving the Federation for the first time in almost a century free from any major external rivals. This new golden era ushered in by Algeron would go on to have a profound effect on all aspects of the Federation, with lasting cultural, societal, economic, and political impacts. But perhaps the most pertinent to the Starfleet would be a drastic reduction in funding provided by the Federation, 
which would result in far fewer new ships being constructed over the next 50-odd years, forcing Starfleet to rely, to varying degrees, on the ships which it had in service already to bulk out the fleet. Fortunately, Excelsior would prove herself to be an almost ideal vessel to hide, tide Starfleet over for this period, being a large, modern, for the time, and capable platform upon which it would be relatively straightforward to add additional equipment and incorporate new technologies as needed and as they became available. Because of this happy little accident, Starfleet would be able to rely upon Excelsior for over half a century, from the mid-2390s until the class's age had become blatantly apparent to everyone in the late 2340s, leading directly to the development of the Galaxy program and its family of related Starship designs. Uh, Excelsior, though, would stick around for decades afterwards, due both to the numbers available and the succession of crises that faced Starfleet and the Federation in the later half of the 24th century. Watch The Next Generation in Deep Space Nine if, if you're not clued into what those... It's the, the Borg and the Klingon and the Romulan and the Dominion. It's a whole thing that they had to deal with, and they had a lot of Excelsiors to make up the numbers, I guess. Okay. Now that we've established a lightning round summary of what the Excelsior class is, the not that lightning, but I mean, still fairly long, as well as its service life, let's now take a look at why the ship was able to stick around for so long. What qualities made it so ideal for Starfleet for so long? Especially given the apparent typical prime service life of a cruiser class of Starfleet of around 20 years. Note that this is the period where the ship is usually the biggest, most capable ship in the fleet not how long it sticks around after that. At first, it might seem strange that the ship would stick around this long, but even in the real world, this really isn't all that strange in the grand scheme of things, and we don't even have to get really into the weeds to see similarities and parallels which may help us explain how Excelsior was able to stick around for so long. But before we start comparing future Starship classes with current world examples, let's first go over some of the reasons why Excelsior was viable for so long. One of the primary reasons Excelsior was able to stick around was just how spacious the initial design was. All ships are built with the concept that new tech and equipment will be put aboard during the ship's service life. That's just inevitable as technology marches forward. But in the case of Excelsior, it seems that Starfleet's design team went above and beyond in their allocation of space for future-proofing and provisions for future crew expansion to make use of the new tech. You add a new sensor or a new weapon, you need crew to use it. Designing a ship with over three times the internal volume as the prior generation heavy cruiser the Constitution class, while also boasting a crew around twice that of the previous ship, so you had plenty of internal space to play around with. This meant that Excelsior was less cramped to begin with versus older designs, which made it a far simpler process to find space for a new sensor palette here, slightly larger shield generators replacing the older ones, expanded sickbay facilities to give the ship better ability to operate in disaster relief, yada yada yada. Size, or rather space, matters when it comes to starships, maybe not in other areas, but definitely in starships. The more room you have, the better. And Excelsior had plenty of space to spare when launched. Aside from her size and space, Excelsior also had a large amount of redundant systems, uh, excess power conduits, and relays built in. This would help inadvertently to future-proof the ship. Due to her nature as the Great Experiment, Excelsior was provided with numerous redundancies and fail-safes. This served as a means of preserving the ship in the event that some of her more groundbreaking technologies failed spectacularly. You can think of it a little bit in how some early jet aircraft continued to use piston engines, because piston engines were more reliable, as that kind of... I, I don't know, uh, holdover. Um, as a result of this, when Starfleet would go to add a new bit of something to the Excelsior, to the space frame, it would be a fairly easy to find a way to plummet into the ship's existing circuitry. Just 
find the nearest junction or input section, and you can make it work uh, without the hassle found on many other ships. You don't have to worry about if we add this newer generator, this newer shield generator here, that uses 20% more power, so if we power it on, what systems are going to fail and lose power as a result? You had plenty of that to deal with. Uh, you don't have to worry about the, the ship's circuitry overloading because you have all of this extra stuff because they built all of that in. At the same time, once you've taken up available slots for expansion and there isn't any more extra power or room available, because the design has so many redundancies built in, you can remove some and you can get more capacity for upgrades. You decide that you need more crew quarters because you've added all of this extra stuff. You look around and you realize that an auxiliary reactor isn't necessary anymore because the main reactor has been proven to be so reliable. So you can rip that out and you have a large area that you can turn into crew accommodation. It's nice to have. And as the final major advantage the Excelsior had, we have the ship's sheer power, in which we are combining speed, firepower, as well as power generation. These things were all so good when Excelsior launched, or rather the advance of technology slowed sufficiently and for long enough that Excelsior could remain viable throughout this period. She had enough power to spare to add extra stuff on, but she also remained powerful enough that she was a serious uh, and viable platform. Now, granted, the power creep of the decades would not be so slow that Excelsior would continue to be the most powerful ship in the fleet throughout its life. The design began its life as a battleship and pride of the fleet, but during its later years of service, she would gradually slide down the classification ladder and was steadily re-rated as newer and more powerful ships entered service to supplant it in its current role. However, the fact that the ship was able to remain a viable class for so long, not becoming painfully slow, underpowered, or too, uh, you know, pathetic for useful service, testifies to the slow pace of technological progress in this era. Okay. So now it's time to wrap this video up with a conclusion, hopefully before the script gets over 2,000 words long, as this is going to be a fairly long video as is. But before I can end the video, I want to go over briefly some of the real-world parallels to Excelsior's long service life, explaining what they are and why they stuck around for so long and comparing them as a potential one of many reasons why Excelsior would stick around for so long. And this is not just an excuse for me to show pictures of some things I like from the real world. I will not accept, 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 accept that slander. The first of two examples we're looking at is the B-52 bomber, an aircraft which first entered service in the year 1955 with the United States Air Force. And it's still going strong today despite having an active service record of just shy of 70 years at time of recording and also boasting an impressive service record to boot, a record which includes more than the normal bomber stuff of unaliving people with lots of boom-boom dropped from so high up the crew doesn't have to think about it too much after the fact. When this aircraft entered service, things like the P-51 Mustang from World War II were still considered perfectly viable combat aircraft, though they were somewhat long in the tooth and jets were around. Uh, and it's now serving in an era of hypersonic missiles and laser weapons, and serving actively despite her, its apparent age. So how is this possible? Well, the B-52 has remained viable until the present day in large part due to the fact that it can do things no other aircraft can. It's carved a very important niche for itself, and made itself important that of carrying heavy, often deadly things to places very far away from where they started, and then going back to where they started. Few more modern aircraft can match them in this, and because of that fact, they are kept around. The parallel here to Star Trek and the Excelsior is that like the B-52, Excelsior was able to go from its initial designed role, battleship, in the case of Excelsior, and nuclear bomber in the case of the 52, and then find a niche for itself, which was very important to its operators, after it was no longer useful in its main role. 
uh, that would be uh, Reliable Cruiser for the Excelsior and Mass Payload Conventional Bomber in the case of the B-52. There are people in the U.S. Air Force now f flying aboard these whose grandfathers flew aboard them, and that amuses me. Okay, so this video is going to be significantly over 20,000 words. In fact, uh, it's almost 26,000 because the script is written now and I'm looking at the number. But anyway, we're nearly done. Final stretch, guys. Uh, the final real-world example we're going to look at here is the Queen Elizabeth class of battleships serving with the Royal Navy of the United Kingdom. These might be my favorite battleship class, as a side note. Uh, sometimes they beat out the Richelieu class of France, and the Gangut class of the Russian Navy for me, I just, I think they're good all around. This is what a battleship looks like in my head. The French and Russian ones are just weird, and that's why I like them. Now these ships, as well as many other classes of battleship in service at the same time, roughly sort of 1910, 1920, uh, these would be ships like the Colorado class of the U.S. Navy, the Congo class of Imperial Japan, and... Maybe the Cavoir and Doria classes of the Italian Navy, though they're a bit weird. Uh, I think they represent very well in the real world how a ship can stick around for a very long time and remain viable and useful at a time when technology is not moving quickly enough to make them obsolete. For some context, this class entered service immediately prior to and a bit after the outbreak of the First World War with the Royal Navy, and the ships would all fight during that conflict as the most powerful warships to participate in the war. Once peace resumed, they formed the core of the Royal Navy battle fleet, though newer ships were planned to be laid down and even entered construction. However, with the signing of the Washington Naval Treaty in 1922, the class would see its service life dramatically extended. Over the next 20 years, the ships would remain significant elements of the Royal Navy, being refit and rebuilt prior to the outbreak of the Second World War, and then seeing extensive action in that conflict. The reason the ships were able to stick around for so long and remain powerful units is due to the aforementioned Washington Treaty. This placed an artificial limit on both the individual size of battleships as well as the overall numbers which could be fielded by the powers uh, which signed the treaty. These being the United States of America, the British Empire, the, the Commonwealth and Dominions were a bit weird, uh, the Empire of Japan, the French Republic, and the Kingdom of Italy. Uh, it would both oversee a period of peace between the world wars, stopping a naval arms race in its tracks that had started after the First World War, and being one of the contributing factors behind the outbreak of the Second World War. So the QE is an example of a ship remaining viable because outside factors caused something of a slowdown in battleship construction, making the ships useful for far longer than they may have otherwise been. The norm at this point was you build a ship, it's obsolete either before it, it enters service or it has a few years of glory and then becomes obsolete as newer designs enter service. This was not the case here, and it made the ships very useful even into the Second World War and beyond. In much the same way, Excelsior stuck around because following the Kitimur Accords and Tomid Incident, and then the Treaty of Algeron, the Federation found its main rivals either ruined economically so bad that they couldn't compete with the Federation for decades, this being the Klingon Empire, or else cowed and embarrassed to such a degree that they retreated behind the neutral zone for decades, and didn't play an active role in galactic politics, in the case of the Romulan Star Empire. The fact that for decades there was no peer-level power to challenge Starfleet possibly slowed technological development and disincentivized the Federation away from investing in keeping up a large-scale construction program for their fleet. It made it very little sense to politicians to keep building generations of ships to totally replace older, perfectly useful vessels every few decades when there was very little perceived need for the ships and the resources and manpower such programs would require could be better spent improving life in the Federation, 
strengthening colonies, expanding infrastructure, and better connecting the Federation with internal trade and communications networks. That's what you wanted to do. That got votes. That was popular. And it made sense for the time. So those are just my thoughts. The era of the Excelsior is one we don't really know much about, but there have to be several reasons why the Excelsior remained common for so long. And I like to come up with headcanon to explain why this is. Let me know if you have your own theories or ideas, or if you think Excelsior sticking around for so long isn't that odd. Just, you know, let me know. As always, uh, huge thanks to the channel's Patreon supporters, uh, the backers over there. Uh, they help the channel grow. They help me afford random things like new computer mice, because, you know, mine might break every now and then. And uh, I can just... The money from Patreon is there. Uh, so huge thanks to them. Patreon supporters get to vote on uh, content made for the channel. Um, I am going to be putting up this month's Patreon video vote. Uh, every month, Patreon supporters get to vote on a video topic for that month. This one's going to come up, and it's going to mention some things. I'm not entirely sure what all yet, but it will be out there. Uh, they also <laughs> have maybe a more direct line of, hey, the video's too long, and you talk about planes and boats too much, shorten things and shape up, which this video might be an example of. Seriously, if you've made it to the end, bravo. Uh, this has been a long one. And it didn't, it started out as a quick video. I don't know what happened. I have, I'm too, I'm too willing to give myself more work for little reason, I guess. But anyway, yeah, Patreon is there. Uh, feel free if you click the Patreon link. It's not just give me money there. Uh, that's also where I put all the artwork that I use, that I make for and use in my videos. So if you want the, the pictures from the thumbnails or videos, you can find them down there. Um, that's, I mean, I'm, that's it. I'm wrapping this video up because it's getting very long. So no, no brownie points awarded now for getting to the end. Uh, just, uh, why? Why are you here?